I'm uh, uh, Rich Berenick. I'm a professor at Rice University and director of Connections and OpenStax College. Wow, uh, big changes. Uh, 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 the, uh, the seeds of disruption. So, uh, 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 increasing discontent from students, speaking especially for this country, uh, up as far as prices really uh, rapidly escalating. Um, increasingly increasing discontent from faculty about the rigidity of, in spite of the fact that technology is all around them, the rigidity of the curriculum that they're provided by publishers and the fact that it seems to be arbitrarily manipulated. The, you know, they just get their course set up and then a new version of the textbook comes out. It's no better, it's just scrambled, right? Uh, and then I think governments and high-level organizations finally really realizing that this is a big crisis and that maybe they need to do something about it. And so I think the the fact that it's not, it, it, the fact that there are these tremendous economic forces, the big downturn, right, which is over the last number of years, really, I think, accelerated the drive towards openness, I think. Uh, biggest challenges, access. Uh, I mean, people aren't getting access to high quality learning opportunities, again, due to high cost of materials or high cost of tuition or the fact that there's a limited number of places, right? Um, uh, and I think that, so that's one. I think the other is that we're still using, we're in a, we're in a, a, a technology enabled world where communication and is so much easier than it was even just five, ten years ago. And yet the strategies and methods we use to teach are the same ones that we've used for I don't know, a couple thousand years. Uh, so I think there's just a, 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 one of the big challenges is that the world is moving at a very rapid pace, but the, the education world has been moving at an extremely slow pace, and they're, they're, they're tearing apart, I think. And once they tear far enough apart, there's going to be a collapse and a reinvention of everything, I, I think. Openness. So open means many things. Uh, uh, open, you're from the open university. So open can mean, or, or MOOCs, open can mean open enrollment, right? That you break down the barrier of who, who, who can take or can't take a class, right? Uh, an entirely different kind of open is around open source and, and open to innovate on, right? To share the intellectual, that's more an intellectual property thing, right? The ability to, to share in the, in the intellectual sort of enterprise. Uh, and then I think, much like in the open source movement, there's also a, there's a lot of confusion around the word open, and also a lot of people, when things are free, they conflate that with open, right? Uh, and so I think uh, open I think the short answer is that open means many different things to many different people, and that's not necessarily a good thing. In fact, the uh, uh, open source software uh, movement had a major sort of summit about this in the late 1990s, early 2000s, around defining what it means even to be open source. And there's, there's really two factions, right? One focused around Eric Raymond and Linus Torvalds and the, uh, all of that Linux world, and then around Richard Stallman, and they still don't agree. So I, th I don't think we'll ever necessarily agree when it comes to openness for education either. From our perspective at Open Sachs College, right? Um, the, what, the OpenStax College, the word open is in OpenStax College, right? It's the first word of the three. Uh, and our books are all open, right? They're, they're open license, Creative Commons license. Uh, they have all the virtues of an open curriculum, right? But when we talk to faculty about the books, right? And it's the faculty who we are really marketing the books to because they make the decisions, right, on whether to use the book. 
we found that, that leading with open was a very, didn't work because they didn't understand it, right? Or they didn't care. Because to them, the problem for the, those particular, for a lot, many of those particular fa faculty, I'd say the largest percentage of them, they care about the free aspect of the books and the fact that they will stay free. Right? And of course, open guarantees that, right? That they're free now and they will stay free because they're open licensed. But I think open is so nuanced and confusing that uh, we have just decided that, that we always lead with free textbooks because the real crisis that these faculty are trying to solve is the price of textbooks are too high, right? And then once they, once they either buy into it or they ask questions about, well, what if I want to be able to customize the book? Well, then we dive in and say, well, by the way, the book isn't just free. It's also open source licensed. So if you want to change chapters, you can. If you want to edit the book, you can. But I think um, open is, uh, is one of those things like green, right, that everybody thinks, everybody should, un everybody thinks people understand, and yet it's actually quite nuanced and is quite, uh, often confused by people in the press or people in the public. And this is precisely the debate around that, that happened around software in the late 1990s, early 2000s was Richard Stallman wanted to call it free software, but free as in the French word uh, libre, right? Which, and they would always talk about free as in freedom, not as in beer, right? Are you familiar with this debate? Should go. It's it's fa fascinating, right? So, uh, the idea is free is in liberty, right? The fact to them, the fact that it was free as in beer was less important, right? As in free beer, but uh, for the faculty that that we're trying to get to adopt the book so that we can stave off this crisis of of uh, uh, you know, one trillion dollars of student debt just in the United States, it's the free aspect as in free like beer that really sort of matters to those adopters. Um, uh, absolutely. And in fact, this is, now that we've introduced OpenStax College, it, 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 only, mag, it only amplifies the purpose of, of connections, right? That, that uh, OpenStax College is about very carefully curated, professionally authored, not crowdsourced content, right? Uh, and it, it really is sort of a, it, that, well, it's like a book, right? But you have OpenStash College, which is this ha highly curated content. But the point is it's in this platform that now really, you know, will let people really truly uh, 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 easily innovate on that content, make it their own, right? Create their own customized version of our books. And I think one of the one of the problems with connections, in gen in particular, OER in general, is that there's not enough DJing, and the reason is there's not enough records out there, right? Uh, there's only, you know, if you're a DJ, you have hundreds of records you could choose from to play next, but if you're a physics professor, there might be two good OER pieces of material. Well, you're not going to be doing a lot of right DJing with that. So we, what we need to do is get into this world where there's a lot more OER, and, and then I believe that the, the, the DJ effect will really kick in. Well, the Kitty Jones story, which is just a great story, that the reason why she, she is the connection's best, if not best selling, most used author, right? Uh, and I think her content's been used over 25 million times, I think, at least. Uh, that's like last year's statistic. And the, the, the reason why she did it, the sole reason why, is that she was herself a musician, a music teacher. She had friends who were uh, school music teachers in schools, and she saw that the first thing that was cut in the school budgets was the music program. And uh, that left the teachers to either not teach music or teach very you know, poorly or go out and buy the materials themselves out of their pockets, own pockets. And so, so what really pushed her to develop her content was that, that kind of crisis. And I think um, 
what what's amazing about that is is that her that's why her content has been so popular because it really hit on that nerve of of she had just identified an, an area that was really ripe for in a sense disruption right uh, and uh, that content continues to be e extremely well used and I think you can think of OpenStax College as a very similar example that you know when you look at uh, now it's not little kids or teachers teaching little kids about music now it's about people who are trying to go to community college in the United States and the book costs more than it costs to register for the class and so they're they're not taking the class and so what we're we're seeing is this you know the rapid you know growth in OpenStax College is primarily we think because of the fact that it's not that these are just good books that are convenient but it's because the people who need these books truly can't take these courses otherwise so um, I, th I think that that's an area where that to me that's the real growth area for OER is really in these and there's plenty of them, right? Areas that are really under under crisis. Interesting. Uh, so, I would say there there have been uh, um, for sure, right? I mean, the we were kind of in there at the beginning, right? I would I wouldn't claim that connections it, itself influenced all these other projects that came along later, right? But, but this OER, this whole movement, right, of, of open educational resources, there's no question that I believe that the most important thing about MIT OpenCourseWare is not the content, it's the fact that MIT as an institution said, we, we don't want to try to commercialize this content, right? We really think that we should be making this available. Right and not commercializing it, and the, and right and going back in time to when that project was launched, that it was a time when other universities were extremely excited about how much money they were going to make from all of their course content, and so so seen in that perspective, the, that that MIT project is very very important, right? Um, I, I I think that that. Um, you know, OER is is making some states right really think seriously about you know co college content and K twelve content. There are a number of bills, Washington, Oregon, Texas, Virginia, other places. Um, but so there has been a lot of progress. But I would say for the most part, though, uh, this most recent Babson study indicates that if you go to educational institutions most of them still actually don't even know what OER is. So uh, there's still a huge, long way to go, I think. So, so has there been some change? Yes. But, but should we be smug about progress? No, no way, right? There's so much more to be done. Right, uh, how to address that issue? Well, I think May, uh, uh, the way I would describe it, the way to address it is to make OER that matters, right? And uh, and th th this is why we, we talk about this OER 1.0 world and an OER 2.0 world. And I would say that we, we live in a world right now, this OER 1 world, or have lived, that is a fairly closed community, even though we're open, but fairly close community of people really excited about this idea, uh, who are just absolutely committed to it, who are building the tools to support it, or doing the content, or trying to you know entice get other people involved in this community. But I think that the the focus has been kind of on the wrong things, right? Like it's it's just been around this informal sharing, you know. Oh, I put up my course notes, right? Or uh, around building platforms. There's too many platforms, right? And above, so everything's fragmented. I think the content is not at a, a high enough quality level for the large part. I, I just, I don't, don't think so. And I think that the pr problem then is if you go to a, to a, uh, an administrator at a, a or, or, you know, someone running a big school or an institution or a government and say, look, we should go to an OER world, you should be able to 
the, the first question they ask is, well, show me the stuff. And if you can't show them this great stuff that they're like, wow, I could really use this, they, well, they just don't take you very seriously, right? And so, so we're really proponents of moving into an OER 2.0 world, right? Which, which, which is, is very much like if you think back to open source software, open source, oh, there are all kinds of projects, you know, with useful little tidbits here and there. But open source really became uh, a world-changing force, I believe, when like a few things happened. One is somebody came up with a complete package that was Linux that could do everything, almost everything, to run a big computer, right? Uh, and it was really good, right? Didn't break. Okay. Suddenly, and they built an ecosystem around it with for-profit providers like Red Hat. Suddenly there was an industry, right? And, and it was a challenge to Windows and a challenge to, and now Apple, right? Mac OS is built on open source, right? And it's a, a, a large percentage of the world's web servers run Linux. They run open source software. So it really is a part of that world, right? But they had to have something that people could test, right? And say, wow, this is really good. And that you could have companies that say, hey, we're going to have a business model around this, right? Too much of OER is still around this informal kind of sharing. So we believe that you need to move into a world where you have the OER is really high quality and it has a real purpose. Like it is a textbook and it has companies that are willing to back it as uh, you know being involved in it, right? Stake a business model on it, right? And where it can really solve an actual problem. And, uh, you know, so that's what we're trying to do with OpenStax, right? And, and believe me, we, we know the frustrations, you know, I know firsthand the frustrations, right? Because we've been doing connections for 14 years, and we just suddenly realized that there's a, a, a chasm, right? That OE, o, this OER 1.0 is on this, this one side of the chasm with the zealots and the people that are really excited, but the mainstream is worlds away. And until we can find the con, do make OER the kind of con, make in o in this world of OER the kind of content the mainstream needs, we're never gonna be be we're, we're never gonna cross that chasm. So I mixed a whole bunch of things all up there, but I think that's to me the absolutely critical thing. And it's it's kind of funny just going back that we've had fabulous advisors to connections, right? Like we have people who are you know very successful vent entrepreneurs, venture capitalists. And the very first book that one of them gave me in 1999, right, was Crossing the Chasm, right? Did I read this book? Of course I read the book. Did I heed the, did I heed the advice? Of course not, right? And so here we are, you know, 13, 14 years later, finally realizing that that's, you know, that's what we need to be doing. So, uh, well, it's two, two, well, the first thing about connections is our tools are, are make it too hard to be a de educational DJ, right? It's not, it's, it's too hard and it's certainly no fun, right? And so that's why we've invested all of this foundation funding to totally rebuild the tool set. And so I think, you know, you're, 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 we're just really going to vastly increase the usability of the tools and I think what that is going to do is really grow the the number of folks who are actually innovating on the material like the DJing right um, because really if you think about OpenStax College um, if no one was ever going to DJ we could just publish a PDF file or an EPUB and be done right but that would be so sad right because there wouldn't be the you wouldn't be available and open in a technology sense for people to innovate on the material, right? So we're working very hard on those tools, right? And then the other, the, what, what, what we're working on hard with OpenStax College is completing this first library of 25 books, right? And really trying to raise awareness about those books so that not just OpenStax College, but a whole bunch of other open access projects can get, basically it's like a wedge, right? Get a wedge into this market and, and hopefully help OER really go into the, main, into the mainstream. 
Ooh, wow. Uh, open access platform. That's terrible. <laughs> no, that's no good. Uh, uh, three words to describe. Three words. Can I use four? Sure. Well, I would just, well, there's and. I said it's connecting people and content. Well, uh, let me think. Well, I, th I think the, uh, well, just a great, this came up at the, at the, at the conference, right? Mm. But this, um, our jo the job of, 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 of getting the word out about OER and pushing the movement forward has just got harder, unfortunately, because of the confusion with MOOCs, right? Which are an entirely different animal, right? Related, right? We're all in the same family tree, but they're just an entirely different thing. MOOCs are about open access, o open enrollment, fundamentally, right? And I think that... Uh, the fact that there's such a tremendous hype around MOOCs right now is uh, uh, it definitely makes it an uphill battle to um, to explain what OER is, what it's trying to do, and the problems that we're trying to solve. So we get asked all the time, "Oh, OpenStash College, it's a MOOC, right?" No, right? Because and the problem is is that there's a positive and negative kind of. Uh, People have con ne positive and negative views of what a MOOC means, right? If to some people it's tremendously exciting, positive democratization of education, right? Uh, but to some other people, faculty and teachers, who are the market for OpenStax College, a, a percentage of those folks feel very threatened by MOOCs just because it, they're a disruptive force, right? And they're going to just MOOCs. There's no question MOOCs will disrupt their industry. And so if there's confusion or that somehow OER is about MOOCs, then it could turn off some faculty. They won't even want to listen when we try to talk to them about merely free textbooks, right, that can help them do a better job and help their students have better learning outcomes, right? So I think that's something that's going to be very different, difficult over the next couple years is trying to keep the keep things clear that, that these are, or, or make things clearer that there's a delineation between the two. Not that I don't like MOOCs, I love MOOCs, but it's just uh, uh, confusing.